Hi everybody, welcome back. Tonight we're going to um, look at uh, attachment and how that affects us and how we can deal with different ways we can deal with it. Uh, everyone hear me okay? Probably when I turn like that, they, you can't. I should remember that. Okay, great, thanks. So, um, just going to introduce um, meditating on the mind. Uh, last week we did um, meditating on the breath to calm down. Um, but His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he often recommends... Um, meditating on the nature of mind and uh, it has all the usual benefits of of um, becoming more alert and sharp-minded and um, calming us and um, yeah like generating mindfulness and stability and all that um, also great for the memory developing a more clear memory but um, as well as that which any concentration meditation will develop the mind is also really great to familiarize ourselves with from the point of view of, of when we die because when we die we only have our mind left so all the, all the senses shut down and we just experience awareness. So if we're familiar with that and comfortable with that experience, it really helps at that time, at that crucial time. And... Um, the mind is, is also similar to the breath in that it's always there within us. So it's, it's uh, always something readily available to us. However, meditating on the mind or even just identifying the mind is generally a whole lot, a whole lot more... Um, tricky at first than just the breath. The breath is, you know, you can't miss it. But um, with the mind, it can be quite, yeah, quite um, difficult at first to to know exactly what that is. I remember when um, Geshe Doga used to... Um, have us meditate on the mind. Oh, he did it for a whole year, um, like once a week. Um, and yeah, I have to say that the whole time I did not know what I was meditating on, what I was supposed to be meditating on. It, but I've looked into it since, so I will explain. So, um, the nature of mind is defined as clear and knowing and that is like clear as in there's no there's nothing in the way it's like space so it's it's not blocking us knowing anything so we can we can freely know anything that that we come in contact with or any thoughts that arise. So that clarity allows that. And the and so the knowing part is just being aware or experience. Sometimes it's defi defined as experiencing whatever we perceive or cognize.
Yes, so knowing or awareness are synonymous. So let's get started with the meditation. So just getting comfy and relaxing our posture so that we're not tense. Allowing our, our mind to settle. And let all the thoughts drop away. And just focus for a bit on relaxing the body. Releasing any taut muscles. Just doing a a body scan relaxing the shoulders and the hands just sitting loosely in your lap and then focus on the breath for a few moments to center our attention So when focusing on the mind, all the great meditators advise us to completely let go of the past, all thoughts of the past, and to stop thinking of the future, and to just abide in the present moment without following any thoughts or other distractions. So abiding on the nature of mind, which is clear and knowing clarity and awareness whatever that means to you whatever appears in your awareness when you think of that definition it's also described as clear light or luminous awareness
So rest in this awareness. with your whole attention. So this knowingness or awareness is beyond thoughts, beyond conceptions. It's just naked or bare awareness. Gradually, as we rest in awareness, we may find that we merge and become one. That is, instead of our mind or our awareness focusing on awareness, our mind becomes awareness, unified with our object of meditation. So there's no separation. No longer being aware of awareness, but being awareness itself.
All right, well, we'll leave the meditation there. So His Holiness uh, also describes that after a while from meditating on, on the mind that it can be like an appearance of clear water. So I haven't ever had that experience, but um, it's an individual thing too, I think. So it's uh, something that once you get more familiar with, it's a very natural state to be in and very soothing, very centering. So um, now we're going to tackle attachment and although attachment is a disturbing state of mind it can come in the guise of a, a very attractive object the object that we're attached to so we have that, that appeal happening as attachment is growing so it's a little bit sneaky it's like subtle um, under undercover kind of experience that we don't recognize necessarily straight away so like take the example of falling in love or buying a new car or getting a diamond ring or something really precious something that is yeah a really big thing in our life and so the mind that that, that is clinging to that object as in liking that object and and wanting wanting it in our life that it, that starts to become the the painful issue and and what we call attachment so just going over uh, the th there's three levels of attachment and we talked a little bit about this last last week and the deep rooted level is is something that we it's so unconscious that we don't even notice it uh, it's just happening way in the background and then it, it plays out in kind of um, unrecognizable ways we, we don't actually know that it's happening and then the next level up is is the kind of um, overriding or undercurrent grasping mind that we have towards something that we like and and that is and along with that is the the mind of discontentment which causes that grasping mind to happen so that's kind of the middle level where we're sometimes aware of that going on it's more um, in our face a little bit and um, and it's the sort of mind where we're never really satisfied or content with what we have or where where we're at so then the next level up that which is called the gross level which is really noticeable a lot of the time is the, the sort of mind states of emotions like desire desire kind of very similar to attachment but attachment is where we're really clinging to something we already have something something we um, see as beautiful or precious or 
um, what's the other word, like advant advantageous to us. And um, whereas desire is wanting more and wanting better of that. So they, they all can go hand in hand as well. And then also other other um, offshoots of attachment or emotions that go along with it are things like possessiveness and um, what's the other ones? Um, oh yeah, like even just reputation, want, wanting to have like an impressive reputation, um, wanting power, lusting after power, um, wanting approval in our life. I mean, these things are happening quite obviously to us a lot of the time, these sort of mind states. And um, yeah, greed, I think I mentioned obsession. Uh, fear of losing what we have. All those things go hand in hand with with uh, the the obvious level of attachment. So we can see how these kind of disturbing states of mind are traveling traveling along with us and can take over a little bit too much. And there's a quote of Geshe Dogas, he's the resident teacher here. He, he says, an atta attachment is an irrational state of mind that is not conducive for your happiness. So by rational, he's talking about um, unrealistic, um, and he also says, under the control of attachment, it's very difficult to be objective. So we lose ourselves. So the afflicted mind kind of takes over and overwhelms our better judgment and really overwhelms our well-being. So like, say the example I used before of being in love, you know, if we're crazy about somebody, then we're insecure about losing them. Um, this insecurity is, is painful. That, that's an obvious sign of attachment. Like if we miss someone when they're not around, we're dependent on them, we rely on them for our happiness. So that, that sort of thing is what we don't need in our life. So, in the case of, um, say, our partner, we may, th we may think that we love them, but if, if we have a huge amount of attachment, then that's actually the opposite of love. So, it's, love is, is when we want others to be happy, and attachment is, is when we're solely concerned for ourselves. But of course, in, in a relationship, we have a mixture of both generally. That's common. And depending how much of attachment we have, so to that degree, we have more disharmony in our relationship. We have more domestics, so like that. And the more love we have, the more happiness we have, the more um, harmony and the more um, all the good things like trust and, and um, looking after each other. So love in this sense, this true love is, is actually only can be in relation to other living beings. So we can't have love for inanimate objects because of that definition where Love is wanting others to be happy. Though we can still be attached to 
inanimate objects, obviously, plenty of that happens. So attachment can become a real issue. I mean, it can affect our, even our physical well-being. I mean, people do actually die of a broken heart, amazingly. They actually die. So um, to what, you know, lesser degree we get affected physically, like, say we, um, we get dumped or whatever, just keeping on that example, so the, the pain of, of, of loss and the, and the um, you know, that, that fear, it kind of um, permeates our, our stomach and our, even our bowels, you know, you feel, you feel kind of like, um, traumatized. So that, that has a really um, big impact on, on our physical well-being and anxiety kicks in. I mean, it depends what emotions arise from, from that sort of thing, resentment and so on. But So what ways have we got to deal with, with attachment? Well, last week I was, I was uh, touching on how when we focus on the feeling that, is, that we're experiencing, if we fully merge our awareness with it, then it can really release and shift whatever we're going through so that emotion can really turn around and really just dissolve. So that's one way and we can do a meditation on that later. But also there's another, there's another way where, you know, we're just realistic too. We look at it like, so there's a technique where we can Think of something that's really, you know, the something we just love about that object that we've just lost, whether a person or a thing we've just broken or whatever, um, smashed a car up or whatever it is. But usually, it's it's a pet or a person. So we think of. Um, something that's really beautiful about that re relationship we had or that person we had or that, um, that, that pet. And then we think of something negative about them. So we go quite quickly from one, one side to the other thinking a positive one and then we think of something that didn't work for us about that relationship or, or that person or whatever that was against the grain, something we didn't like. And then we go to another thing that we did like, a different thing from the first one. And then we go back and we think, try and think of a negative thing. We just keep doing this and sometimes it gets a little bit hard trying to think of more different ones, but we keep doing that for, for a while, quite a while. And what we find is we end up feeling centred we're not drawn either way. And it's not like an intellectual thing. It's more that we just feel centered and resolved. We're not like, you know, like still craving after that thing anymore in the same way. It's really dynamic. And, um, and it's also realistic. So, this is where the dream comes in. The dream is like an illusion. The dream reference being that what, you know, are we living the dream, that, that one? So it's like, um, 
yeah, the dream has this double illusion. So on, on one level, it's, it's like, well, whatever we expect or count on in life never turns out like that. So we might have um, an idea of what, what we want or how we want it, but it's always different in reality when it happens. That's one level, but then ultimately life is like a dream. And the analogy that um, Buddhism often uses is that like the nighttime dream that we have, when we wake up, it vanishes. So whatever was going on in the dream, like um, sometimes, you know, it's quite interesting and, and um, you, you're really involved in it and, and, and you want to go back to sleep to finish it off kind of thing. But um, whatever drama was going on in the dream, when you wake up, it's like, you know, it never even happened. Like it's in the, in the real sense. So it's actually the same with, with our life. Like we, we buy into our life, like we buy into a dream. But what we're buying into is, is, is something that we think, which is actually not the reality. So, yeah, so we, we really get, the way we get sucked into a dream is similar to how we live our life as well. Because, like, basically we can, whatever thought or feeling we have, we create our experience. So if it's a good thought, then it's going to be good. It's going to, we're going to feel good. We're going to have a good experience. That's basic, but that's where I'm getting at. So like Lama Zopa Rinpoche, he often talks about how we can transform what we think is bad, such as like, say, depression, feeling depressed. And if we look at it, if we label it bad, because mostly that's what we do, no one, you know, seriously likes depression. But he's saying that if we buy into that, then we compound it. and. We, and, and it goes nowhere but, but down, worse. Whereas if, if we have a different perspective on things like depression, we can see it that there's different levels of, of advantages to us going through something like depression, something bad, bad, that it becomes good. So it's like he would say, it's an opportunity to purify our mind. So instead of getting sucked into that depression, we can see it as our negative karma ripening and so that we actually don't have to experience it again, that particular depression again. And so we can turn it around. But and I mean, depression is also an indication of something deeper going on. So it's, it's often to do with anger directed at ourself. And so by accepting the depression and not... So accepting it in the sense of feeling okay about it rather than compounding it being so bad, by accepting it in that way, We, I can't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> okay.
So anyway, something else I was going to say is that if we if we recognise that a thought or a feeling doesn't exist in and of itself, but it's dependent on our mind, then that's really liberating. And in the immediate sense, that gives us a way out. It gives us a, a, a breath of fresh air from whatever we're stuck in. But also in the long term, it has a positive karmic result. So we're going to go in a little bit more into karma as well. talked a little bit about karma last week being a mental urge so carrying on from creating a positive thought instead of a negative one that then has a karmic result a consequence of of a positive experience later, not only in the moment, but in the next life as well. So based on our positive mind states, we, we then have positive actions, positive speech, that sort of thing. And so, Say with attachment, attachment is a mind of clinging and possessiveness and craving and, and um, yeah, wanting to, um, like grasping onto, right? So that, that, um, That has the long-term effect of basically what we all tend to face is a natural, um, a naturally grasping mind onto whatever is appealing to us, instead of and and like that that wanting more. So it's creating that, and so whenever we experience that if we let go of that we're changing our karma so that that's arising from previous lives of that um that mode of of that grasping mind and so the more we can like let go of that in the moment when when it's happening the, the more we're creating space for ourselves in the future to not ha even have that grasping mind. And um, also, what, um, what those sort of, that mind state leads to, the different um, actions that we do and the, and the different ways that, um, of, like speech. So, so we, there's, commonly referred to as 10 um, non-virtuous um, like there's there's four of there's three of, of, of physical ones there's four speech and there's there's the three root causes from the mind so what I'm getting at is that the attachment, leads into such things as stealing or sexual misconduct, um, 
yeah, mainly those. And, and so the karmic results of those are very specific too. And, the, and they're examples of where, say, like, um, for instance, if we were to cheat on our partner, then in, the, in a future life, there's a, there's a very specific consequence of that ripening in our experience. And basically, it's so specific that it, it's going to ripen with that same person doing that to us. So, and then also there's the environmental result. So basically with karma, there's, there's four ripening aspects. There's the immediate one that we're born into. And then when we're reborn as a human, we have a result that's similar to the cause that got us there. So like that one where we, and that's behavioral or environmentally. Um, so, or experientially. So um, in the case of, of say, uh, sexual misconduct, we, we have the, the um, like I said, when we're, when we're ex in the next life, we have this, first of all, we have this tendency to commit adultery again. And also we have the, res like the ripening of it happening to us too. So there's that and that the the one that's s res the in the similar to the cause in behavior is the really really uh awful one because it uh propels us again and again to go through the same thing life after life so when we have these um awareness of 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 the mind if we can instead let go when we get stuck like in those situations where we have um, these things happening to us if we can let go and change the mode of, of our actions then it, it really creates a an opening for us so I think we'll just do a meditation on focusing on the feeling that we were talking about before. It's just such a um, really transformative way to deal with difficult issues whether it's an emotion, whether it's a even like even good good feelings can be released. So like we're not we're able to open up and not get stuck with things. So yeah, it's it's and we, and we can also do it with with um, physical feelings. So, for instance, like say we have fear, and there's this overriding churning, but it's it's sort of a murky um, a murky emotion, but there's also it's also causing us to feel murky as well, feel really uneasy um, and also churning, you know, physically. 
So we just go into whatever feeling is arising at any time. And all right, well, we'll just do it. We'll just sit and focus for a bit. And I'll, I'll lead you through the meditation. So we we'll get comfortable. And you can think of a, a time where there's a strong emotion coming up. It can be anything. It can f be the feeling of rejection by someone you love. It can be a fear of loss or the feeling of loss or being abandoned, grief or another sort of heartbreak, it can be anxiety. If you choose something that's an issue for you, the stronger the problem the easier it is to focus on it and br because you need to bring it to mind. Now, look for, look for the most prominent feeling within you that is presenting in this moment. And this can change from moment to moment. In one instant it can be physical and the next moment it can be an emotional overriding it. So you just keep tracking down what's whatever feeling is arising. So you bring your awareness deeply into that feeling. We're not thinking about the feeling. First of all, we thought of, of, of some issue or some emotion that we're stuck with. And then we let go of, of our conceptual mind altogether. And we're just feeling the feeling. So how that works is basically you bring your awareness into the heart of that feeling as much as you can. It can be slippery and elusive. So you just keep tracking it down. Just keep mentally trying to find it.
So you try and become one with that feeling, meaning your awareness. And immerse totally with the feeling. You're trying to find the center of that feeling, the essence of it. or whatever the feeling has become. And you try and sit with that. Just rest in that feeling. And it's more the trying to find it that happens because the feeling appears to be one thing but when we look for it it's not like that so the process of looking for it is part of the meditation So we can leave the meditation there and just um, got a few minutes to um, talk about that if you have any questions or um, yeah, about that or any of the rest of it. Um, yeah, with that technique, it's also like what we can tap into when we first meditate on a feeling is like a, a particular level of it too sometimes. So what happens is after a while, say we've been trying to focus on feeling broken hearted and then so we, we do that for a few minutes and then we don't feel any different. So that's going to be the way it appears. But what we find is over time, I mean, sometimes we can, sometimes we can just cut through. It has happened to me where I um, instantly felt released, resolved, even just like with that strong attachment that came up. I mean, it wasn't the first time that I'd released on 
on that feeling in my life but this particular occasion when it triggered it was like I just went into the feeling and I instantly felt relief so that does happen but I had spent a lot of previous hours <laughs> meditating on attachment so that would have helped but um and also with a with that particular person so that would have also helped but um also what i was going to say is we can feel released say it might hit us a little bit later on you know we we've done a little bit of focusing on the feeling and then later on we just out of the blue we notice that we feel a whole lot better that can happen too that's that's what often happens but then down the track it can get triggered again and we feel like oh well what happened you know like I thought this was resolved but what does happen is that we've resolved a certain level of it and then there's deeper levels that are still sitting there and they need to be also addressed so it can take time like that especially with something big like attachment that's huge that's one of our main major problems so yeah definitely over time it will take time and and we will we will get triggered again for sure um especially with trauma that that is um sitting there related to attachment in our life i mean trauma that we wouldn't even necessarily remember but the feeling of it um will get triggered and so yeah we just keep we keep focusing on the feeling and, and gradually chip away at all these levels any questions Yeah, in the sense of. Well, I think, uh, I think it's a really important if you're attached, if you're getting attached to a happy family, it's a really positive thing. It's not something else. So, attachment to your family is, is a positive thing. Yeah, perhaps you're using attachment in, in the sense of um, more like perhaps a different sense um, what would be another word that that you could think of like because you're not just thinking of like the love that you have in the family but um, yeah so the unity that you have in the in the family or yeah okay so I think that's um to do with what I was saying in the beginning that attachment comes in the guise of appearing um, positive or alluring you know it, it's, it does have that connotation probably in our society too I think um, if we check up the the meaning in the sense of attachment being basically a basically a self-centered need a, a kind of um, wanting happiness for ourselves. so I'm not sure that that's what you're thinking of when you're thinking of your family you know I think we of course we get a lot of joy out of our family but but being attached to that is not necessarily going to bring us joy being attached to what the joy that the family brings so the attachment is it's like the yeah the silent kind of insidious um, pain causing problem because I mean if the family were to die 
how are we going to cope with that? We're going to feel, obviously we're going to, um, because of our love for the family, we're going to, um, we're going to be so like distraught that their, their life is ended. But from the point of view of, of our um, missing them, the, the pain of missing people is attachment. So whatever brings us pain doesn't have to be there. We can overcome that, you see. So grief is attachment. Grief is to do with, um, well, it depends how we define grief, but it's, it can be come come really from what I was talking about last week, the ignorance, the un misunderstanding of reality too. So it can be attachment, but involved in grief, um, quite often is, but it can stem more from um, not being aware of of the way things exist. So it's it's a grief come can basically be um, I mean it's it's so demo demobilizing and um, under you know underwriting it's it's not a, a valuable thing. You know, I know that um, you know, we naturally grieve, but the, le the less we cling on to something that's no longer there, the more realistic we are and the less we're going to suffer. So from that point of view, because I don't want to say like um, grief is no good because we need to honour wherever we're at with something, but basically it's not a helpful emotion. It's not um, leading to um, anything really constructive. But we're going a bit over time here, so um, just when the conversation's getting good. <laughs> anyway, um, next week we're going to look more into um, aversion and anger, those sort of states of mind. And the karmic results of those too. And um, yeah, there'll be more of that. And um, yeah. So we have cake and tea in the dining room if you want to stay. <laughs> <laughs>